great small group tonight. Man, that was awesome. Great idea ending early for Valentine's Day. Yeah, Randy told me he has something special planned, but it's a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he knitted you a sweater. <laughs> You know, usually on special occasions, I take her to Taco Bell. But I think I'm going to step it up a little tonight. Double chocolate Frosties. Any excuse to end small group early is okay by me, Valentine's Day or not. You can only be a blessing for so long. It's exhausting. Goodbye. Take care. Okay, while well, everyone is gone and happy Valentine's Day, your surprise tonight is a candlelight dinner that I've prepared for you this evening. Thank you. I sure hope you enjoy the dinner tonight. This is so nice. Spinach salad and spaghetti. I'm glad I put a lot of effort into it this evening. Dinner! Sherman! Well, one sec, we're having dinner. We thought you were gone. Oh, no, I don't have any plans this evening. You don't have any plans at all? No, I'm just going to hang out with you guys. I did have a couple of these chocolates. Wait a minute. Where did you get those? Oh, in your closet, underneath the sweaters. Not a very good hiding place at all. Evidently not. This looks delicious. Uh, would you mind passing the spaghetti? No. How about uh, some of the juice? Can I have some salad? No. Here's a breadstick. Who in their right mind eats an entire box of chocolates after opening the envelope that says, to my wife? for a chocolate? No, you keep those chocolates, actually, since you've ruined them. Like you ruined our dinner. Like you've ruined much of our Bible study. This whole Sherman thing, I'm just not, uh, I'm just not sure I can handle this anymore, okay? Well, I'm sorry, right, Yeah. No, it's not about sorry. It's okay. not about sorry. It's not about forgiveness. It's about retaliation. And actually, I don't just retaliate. I escalate, oh, all right? Okay. It's going to come at a time when you don't expect it. You know, one of those, pow! You know, yeah. just right at you. Mm -hmm. Just right at you. Yep. Yeah. I will. I bet you will. I bet I will. I bet you will. I will. Jan! I wasn't expecting that. What's the big deal? It's only chocolates. Guess I'll have to make it up to him somehow. As you can tell from our video, we are continuing our series in the Ten Commandments of Community. These are instructions that God has given to us to help us in all relationships, but especially those within the church environment. We are now this morning on our fifth commandment. We have worked through four so far. Talk truthfully was the first. Manage anger carefully was number two. Share generously was number three. And last week we looked at speak encouragingly. Now I hope that you may be noticing that there is some connection between these commandments. They're not just random. For example, both the first and the fourth talk truthfully and speak encouragingly. Both reference the power of the spoken word for building healthy relationships. Likewise, the commandment share generously and speak encouragingly. Both talk about how we can be a blessing to others, whether through our financial resources and gifts or through the verbal affirmation that we give to them. This morning, we're going to look at our fifth commandment. And this one is especially connected to commandment number two the one that says manage anger carefully. And the fifth commandment we are going to look at this morning, I've entitled forgive compassionately. So in just a moment, we're going to look in Ephesians chapter four, verses 31 and 32, but let's pray together 
and commit this time to the Lord's keeping. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given to us. God, your many blessings to us, they're innumerable. We can't even begin to understand how you have poured out your love upon us. We have already seen in the waters of baptism three stories of your amazing grace. And Lord, this room is filled with hundreds and thousands more. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to gather and praise your name. As we look at your word, would you teach us what it means to forgive? that we might fulfill the plans and desires that you have for us. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 4, and listen please as I read verses 31 and 32. Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now Paul begins with a whole list of words, five in fact, that are all connected that have to do with the process of losing our temper. Now those of you who are good counters will notice there are six words in verse 31. That last word, malice, is sort of a general catch-all word. But the first five words that Paul uses in verse 31 describe for us a process by which we end up losing our temper. Notice the first word he says, get rid of all bitterness. This is that hardness of heart because of past wrongs done to us. We grow bitter when others sin against us or do evil against us. That's the first step in the process of losing your temper. The second, actually the second two steps, are characterized by two words that are basically synonymous, rage and anger. So we start first with bitterness in our heart when someone wrongs us. That bitterness in our heart soon becomes an attitude of the mind in which we allow ourselves to become angry internally and we rage in our minds against the person who has hurt us. That then gives way to the fourth word that Paul uses, brawling. It's actually a word for verbal abuse. It can either mean yelling if you raise your voice or combative language, in which case you don't actually have to raise your voice. But it's the idea of fighting with words. And that as that attitude of anger and rage that's in our mind, the next step is it expresses itself in combative language. And that leads to the fifth step, or the fifth progression, which is characterized by the word slander. That's combative language that has become personal. That's abusive language. That's the language that's meant to wound somebody, meant to tear them down. And what Paul has painted for us is this progression that we all go through from sort of inward disposition until we finally lose it and begin to speak in an angry way, trying to wound others with our words. You know what this is like as well as I do. Imagine that you're in a small group and one of the members of the small group has a unfortunate habit of always wanting to one up what somebody else has said, especially you. So you may share a funny story that happened with you during that week and only to hear them say, you think that's funny, listen to this. Or to share something that you're suffering or struggling with only to hear them say, you think that's bad, you should hear what's going on in my life. 
That somehow this person always needs to be sort of the center of attention. That everything has to come back to what's going on in their life. And imagine that after a while this has begun to grate on you. And so you've actually sat down with the person and you've said, Hey, look, can you not do that? That's a, that's a distraction and it's discouraging. And the person apologizes and they're sorry, but they work on it. But pretty soon they fall back into old habits. And imagine that one night before small group, which will be the next night, you begin to just think about this person. And suddenly you're going back through all of those statements that they've made uh, and how much that has bothered you. And pretty soon that bitterness at those statements becomes an anger and a rage in your mind. And perhaps you have a conversation in your mind that you want to have out loud with them when you can really just let them have it. But... So far, it's confined just to your thinking. Well, the next night you go to small group and things are going fine until you share a story and then all of a sudden that person jumps in and does it again. This time they catch themselves, say, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said it that way, but it's too late. That's clicked in your mind and that anger and that rage, suddenly you begin to speak out and you notice there's an intensity to your voice as you address that person and suddenly it's somewhat combative language. Now this is small group, so you don't yell. But you begin to intensely discuss with them, look, what's the matter with you? Why do you keep doing this? And then pretty soon you notice that the words you're using have been chosen to try to wound them, to try to hurt them. Don't you realize you're ruining our small group? You're the reason why none of us are able to really engage because you're always doing this. That's what Paul's talking about here. This progression from bitterness to anger and rage to combative language to finally verbally abusive language. This is a destructive cycle that we all know too well. Paul says we've got to get rid of that cycle. How are we to do that? He gives us the antidote to it in verse 32. Instead of that cycle of anger, be kind and compassionate to one another. Now, what does that mean? Well, he gives us the ultimate expression of kindness and compassion. Forgiving each other. Now, up to this point, what Paul said in verse 31 sounds a lot like our second commandment, which I referenced earlier. Manage anger carefully. Paul's already told us how dangerous anger is, and now he's back at it again. But here's where we can see an important difference between the second commandment, which is manage anger carefully, and this fifth commandment, which is forgive compassionately. And here's the difference. The second commandment really applies to situations for which the person has not acknowledged the wrong they've done to you. It's the case where you and I have been sinned against or have been wounded or have been hurt and the person doesn't know it or won't admit it. In that case, Paul says, you still have to manage anger carefully. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, that very night, give that hurt over to the Lord. Otherwise, you'll give the devil a foothold. And through that anger and bitterness, he will control you. The second commandment has to do with those situations. This fifth commandment, forgive compassionately, has to do with situations where someone acknowledges that they've wronged you. Where someone has confessed and asked for forgiveness. In those cases, Paul says, it's still the danger of going into this cycle of anger. But now, you and I have an even greater opportunity. Not only do we give it over to the Lord, we now have the opportunity to be kind and compassionate and forgive one another. You see, when someone has not asked for forgiveness, there can't be forgiveness and reconciliation. It's still important to be careful of anger and manage it carefully. But when someone has acknowledged what they've done to us, now there is an opportunity to forgive each other 
And then Paul adds this phrase at the end of verse 32, which is the most important phrase in this section. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. And when we hear that phrase, just as in Christ, God forgave you, it makes us think that what Paul has in mind when he wrote that phrase was a story that Jesus had told in Matthew chapter 18. So what I want to do is turn back together to Matthew 18 and look at that story that I think stands behind this command in Ephesians 4. Matthew chapter 18. It's page 695. Matthew 18, we begin in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times, and this is the issue we're talking about in Ephesians 4, someone who wrongs you or sins against you, and Peter wants to know, how many times do I need to forgive them? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now those of you who are thinking, ooh, only 77. The point is, if you're counting, you're not really forgiving them. The idea is you're supposed to constantly forgive them, and to make that point, Jesus tells a story. Verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents, now in today's terms, that's roughly probably $20 billion. Now, if you look in your footnotes, it just says millions of dollars. But remember, this translation is from the 80s. In today's dollars, <laughs> we're talking about probably $20 billion. <laughs> this man was brought to the king. Verse 25, since obviously with that big of a debt, he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before the king. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity. The word is literally had compassion. Same word from Ephesians 4. The servant's master had compassion on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Now let's pause here for just a moment and understand what's going on in the story. Jesus is telling a story that's a parable, but it's supposed to reflect what's happening in real life. In the parable, the king represents God. The servant represents you and I. And the idea here is that you and I have incurred a debt against God's righteousness and grace. Paul has spent the first part of Ephesians talking about this that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were by <clears throat> uh, giving in to the evil desires and the cravings of our flesh, that every single person in this room has wandered on a path away from God, disobeying God, disobeying parents, giving in to anger, giving in to sexual temptation, to jealousy, to lying, to manipulation, whatever it may be. Each and every one of us has sinned against God. And Jesus says that sin has incurred for us a debt that we cannot pay. A debt that is beyond our paying. That when you look at what we've done to God's beautiful creation, when you look at what we've done to others whom God loves, when you look at what we've done through our sin to ourselves, the debt we owe God to fix the damage is beyond anything we could ever pay, like a $20 billion debt. And it says in Ephesians that because of this debt, because of our sin against God, that we were by nature objects of wrath. Wrath. 
What that means is, is God was furious with us. We don't talk much about the anger of God, but the Bible is very clear that God is angry with those who sin against him, that he has rage and fury for what we've done to him, to others, to this world, and to ourselves. And like in Ephesians 4, that cycle of a rage and anger, which should have given way to God cursing us. Instead, Jesus says in this story, when God called us to account, when he made it known to us that we owed him an impayable debt, the servant begs for patience. Now, the story's already told us he's not gonna be able to pay the debt no matter how long he has. Likewise, you and I, if we spent the rest of our lives trying to be good, trying to will ourselves to do good things, we could never, ever, ever repay God for the sins we have already committed. But this king, instead of giving way to this cycle of anger and cursing, chooses instead to be compassionate. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that despite the fact that we were by nature objects of God's wrath, the God who is rich in mercy chose to be compassionate to us. And this servant who simply asked for patience gets instead his entire debt canceled. Just simply gone. The king says, it's erased. Can you imagine? On one day owing $20 billion and the next day, gone. It's all gone, just within a moment's time. And Jesus says, that's what God has done for us. You and I, if you're here this morning and you have asked God for mercy, because of your sins in Christ. That God has completely canceled our unpayable debt. It's just gone. Totally, completely, wholly forgiven. Now as an aside before I move on, I've said much of what I've said in the past tense. God was angry with us. If you're here this morning and you're not yet a believer in Jesus, these statements are present tense for you. That God is angry at your sin. That you are in danger of experiencing the curse of God. He's willing to be generous and to forgive. But notice in the story, the servant has to ask for mercy. And if you're here this morning and you've never asked God for the mercy he's offered in Christ, then God's anger and wrath is a present tense reality for you. But if you're here and you have accepted what God has offered in Christ, then what God gives to us is full, complete, total pardon. All of our sins simply gone away from our account. Amen. But the story continues. Verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, probably $20,000. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded in anger. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. The exact same request that the first servant made of the king. But this time, verse 30, he refused. Instead, the servant went off and had the other servant thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the others saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Pause here for a moment. 
The second part of the story is, is that the man who had been forgiven $20 billion goes out and finds someone who owes him $20,000. Now, the point of that feature of the story is that it is true that other people do owe us a debt, that when they sin against us, they incur a debt that they owe us something for. We don't simply sin only against God. We sin against each other. And the wrong that we do, the hurt that we do each other, does put us in the debt of the person that we have hurt. But notice Jesus is very careful about how much money is owed to who. When we hurt each other, that doesn't even begin to compare to what we've done to God. Any more than $20,000 begins to compare to $20 billion. But notice as well that in this second case where it is servant to servant, the second servant does ask for mercy. This is why I'm saying the commandment forgive compassionately and this story applies to situations where someone has acknowledged that they've wronged us. That's what we're talking about here. The second servant acknowledges that he owes the man $20,000, that he does have a debt, and he asks for mercy. But notice what happens. The man refuses to give it to him. And so we move to verse 32. Then the master called the first servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Now remember, we're that servant in this story. So here is Jesus' point, verse 35. Listen carefully, it's a tough one. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Okay, did you hear that? That's not my idea. I didn't say those words. Jesus tells this story and then makes that point. Do not miss the seriousness of this statement. You may say, well, what about the idea of eternal security, that if we're saved, we're always saved? I believe wholeheartedly in that. But I will say this. The absolute most secure place you can be is in a position of believing and obeying God. And that when you stop believing and obeying God, having assurance and security is misguided. Jesus says here, forgiving your brother is not optional. And so I would think the most secure thing that you and I could do would be to take him at his word and to believe him. Listen to what Craig Blomberg, who is a commentator, an evangelical commentator, he teaches at Denver Seminary. Listen to what he says about this verse in Matthew 18. Frighteningly, many in Christian circles today seem in danger of this judgment because they refuse to forgive fellow believers, speak kindly to them, cooperate with them, or accept their apologies. Counselors often discover that a client's unwillingness to forgive someone lies deep at the heart of all kinds of personal problems. Jesus declares that if people die without having resolved such problems, they may exclude themselves from eternal life with him. Forgiving those who ask for forgiveness from us is not optional. Do you see that Jesus is saying that? Do you understand the seriousness of what he's saying to us? That every single person in this room has been wounded. 
by parents, by children, by siblings, by friends, by coworkers, by neighbors, by people in the church that we know and love, every single one of us has been sinned against. But Jesus says, to refuse to forgive somebody who asks for your forgiveness is not an option because God has forgiven you. And if God has forgiven you, you must forgive them. I was trying to think of a story that might illustrate what this looks like. And on Tuesday, I got an email from Kent Snowink, one of our elders here, who said, I've been praying all week about this sermon and this story keeps coming to mind. And he shared it with me and I thought I'd share it with you. Last summer, Kent uh, was in Honduras at a man named Andy Castillo's church. Andy Castillo was on our staff here at Calvary and like Torn and Brenda, uh, we sadly sent him off to do greater and uh, bigger things and he returned to his native country of Honduras to pastor a church there. Andy's going to be here in April and you'll have a chance to get to meet him and hear his story. But somewhere in his story, you'll hear about a very traumatic experience that he had. He was kidnapped at gunpoint and held for ransom for a week. Most of us have not gone through something like that, but I think you can imagine the horrifying nature of what that would do and the way in which that would shatter your security and your safety in which you feel in life. And he experienced that and it was a horrifying event for him, but it was something God used to help call him to be a missionary to his home country. Well, this Sunday last summer, Kent was there interacting with Andy, and Andy happened to mention offhand as he was telling the story that over there in the church, that's one of the kidnappers. Kent was taken aback, well, what do you mean? Apparently, Andy's faith in Christ had raised questions in this man during that kidnapping process, and that he had begun to seek out the Lord and had actually come to faith and had come to Andy and had asked for his forgiveness. And not only had Andy forgiven him for that event, he had welcomed him into their church. And that every Sunday that man was a part of that congregation. And you can imagine it's not a very big church. And so to interact every week with a person who had put you through that, I think to myself as a pastor, how can you stand up in front of somebody who did that to you? and interact with them as a brother or sister in Christ. And the point of this passage is as Jesus says, well, every Sunday God does that with us. Amen. That every Sunday in his house, God welcomes those who cost him his son. That he welcomes each and every one of us here despite our sins, despite the ways in which we have abused God's beautiful creation and his beloved creatures. And every Sunday he has chosen to forgive us completely and totally. And that sin is absolutely removed from us. Amen. Amen. And that same God says to us that just like Andy, you must forgive others as I have forgiven you. What I'd like to do at this juncture is just take a minute in silence. And I'd like you to ask the Lord, is there anybody that you've not yet forgiven? Not talking about those who have not asked for forgiveness, who have not acknowledged their wrong. That's the second commandment. You're not to be angry with them. I'm talking here in this fifth commandment about forgiving compassionately. Is there anybody who has wronged you and acknowledged that for whom you are withholding some level of forgiveness? Or have you forgiven them the way Christ has forgiven you? Take just a moment and let the Spirit speak to your heart. 